Okay, I've had some really good conversations. Uh, let's talk about a few things that I want to make sure everybody's on top of. Uh, when you put the central y equals in your test graph, you cannot see the entire parabola with the standard viewing window. Now, I'm going to teach you guys, if you don't know already, how to manually adjust the window. Don't just zoom in and out because then you lose the accuracy. Because really, this is a good view of my parabola, except for I can't see that vertex up there. So I'm going to go to window, which is right beside y equals. I'm only going to change one thing because my x values are good. I can see both sides of the parabola. The only problem is I just can't see the top up there. So the only thing I'm going to change is the y maximum. And I'm going to say, it doesn't look like it's that far away, so I'm going to change it to like 15. Okay, I didn't change anything else but the y maximum. And then I can press graph again. And then I'm able to see the entire graph. Okay, so that problem is solved. <clears throat> now, I asked you to fill in that table. I saw a few people kind of tracing along the graph, which you can do, but the best way to do it is to press second graph and it will give you an entire list, an entire table of values. You can find the y value or any of the x values that you want to find. You can move it around, uh, you can scroll up, you can scroll down wherever you need to go. I think I asked you to start at negative 7, so you've got to go, go scroll up a little bit there to get to negative 7. Obviously, negative 72, I have 72 um, squares there on the graph. That one's off the, off the charts. And then once we get to like negative 4, negative 5, negative 4, you can start plotting those points on your graph. Uh, if your window, if your table here looks weird, I had a few people in first period, it didn't have whole numbers on it. Uh, you can press second window, and above that in yellow you see TBL set, that's your table setup. Uh, you can actually tell it exactly where you want your table to start. Mine has negative 7. At the top of it right now, if I needed like negative 50, instead of having to scroll all the way to negative 50, I can go here and I can type in negative 50. The little triangle in front of the TBL, that triangle is delta. Delta represents change in. If you've had a science class, you've probably heard uh, chemistry, you've used that delta before. That means the change, that's how much each step represents. Technically, we can make our table go by halves if we needed to, okay? If I put in 0.5, notice instead of negative 50, negative 49, it goes to negative 49.5, okay? So that's something that you can manipulate if you need to. We don't need to in this case, and I'm going to put it back at like negative 3. All right, so table gives us our tabular values. We're good to go. All right. Who can tell me the domain of a quadratic? Domain of a quadratic. Who calls all the numbers? It's always all the numbers. The domain of all quadratic functions. It's automatic. It's all real numbers. Now. You can write that out. You can write out the words, all real numbers. I use the number symbol, okay? Or there's a symbol for that. Do y'all know that there's a symbol for all real numbers? Yeah? It's the R. I say that it has an extra back on it. It looks like a T and an R put together. It's a single number or a single symbol there. Um, there's no separation, but it looks like a T and an R squished together. Um, that's the symbol for all real numbers. Don't ask me who came up with that. Somebody somewhere along the way. Or, y'all need to become familiar with what we call interval notation. It looks like a point. Okay, interval notation for all real numbers is parentheses, negative infinity, to positive infinity, close the parentheses. That's how you read that. Negative infinity to positive infinity uh, is the domain. That means domain, also remember, domain talks about your x values. Okay, the domain is all the possible x values. So when you're trying to determine the domain of a function, the question is, can I plug this number into my function and get an answer? The reason for that is because 
reason why the domain for uh, all quadratics is all real numbers is because you can take any number and you can square it. Positive, negative, fraction, decimal, doesn't matter. You can square any number and you're going to get an answer. You can multiply it by 2 or negative 2 and you're going to get an answer. And you can add 12 to that and you're still going to get a real number answer. So that's why the domain of a quadratic is all real numbers. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is the axis of symmetry. Okay, the axis of symmetry. Y'all know that parabolas are symmetric. You draw a line through the middle of it. The left side looks identical to the right side. Uh, it's a reflection <clears throat> of each other. So there is an equation for to find the axis of symmetry. That equation is, and it's on your orange paper there, x equals negative b over 2a. It's x equals, because this axis of symmetry is a vertical line, x equals our vertical lines, b and a come from the standard form of a quadratic. Okay, a is the coefficient in front of the x squared, b is the coefficient in front of the x, and c is the constant term on the end. Okay, if you did not know that already, it's ax squared plus bx plus c is your standard form of a quadratic. So, when I say negative b, that means you change the sign of what your b is. So in this case, b is already negative. b is negative 2, so when I plug it into this equation, it changes to positive 2. A is also negative 2. So we've got 2 over 2 times negative 2. Now, I'm hoping that you can do some mental math here and work that out yourself. But I know a lot of you are just in the habit of grabbing your calculator. Because there is more than one thing in the denominator, there's more than one term in the denominator, you must put parentheses around it or it's not going to give you the right answer. So you have to do 2 divided by parentheses 2 times negative 2. Okay. And the answer is negative 1 half. Our axis of symmetry here is negative 1 half. And you should be able to see on your graph that um, the middle of this parabola is between 0 and negative 1. I'm going to put a dotted line here on my graph to represent that axis of symmetry. Now, we've done half the work for the vertex because the vertex is on the axis of symmetry. So we already have the x coordinate of our vertex. It's negative one half. If we know the x value, how do we get the y value in the function? Plug it in. Plug it into the equation. Okay, this one's not on our table because it's a fractional value, so we've got to go and we've got to plug it in. Negative 2, parentheses, negative 1 half, squared, minus 2, parentheses, negative 1 half, plus 12. We get 12.5. Now, Personally, I'm a fractions person, okay? I know that 12.5 makes it easier for you to graph it, but if I'm just writing it down on my paper, then um, I'm going to write it down as 25 over 2, but over to the side, I'm going to put or 12.5 because I need to actually be able to plot that um, on my graph. Now, let me show you that I plugged it in. This is what I'm bad at. I'm bad at showing my work sometimes. Um, okay, I will be uh, posting these notes on Haiku so you can go back and look at them in case you miss something. Oh, All right, so that's my vertex. I'm going to go ahead and plot that on there. That's a little bit off of my graph, so I'm just going to kind of put that point way up there, negative one half, so point five. Okay, you should already have it pretty close there on your graph. 
Um, all right, so is that a maximum or a minimum? It's a maximum. Okay, you hit a maximum value up there um, on your graph. Now, while we're talking about that, let's go back to the calculator for a second. Uh, in case you forget this whole axis of symmetry thing and plugging it back into the equation to find the vertex, y'all know that you can find the vertex on your calculator, right? Second trace, we've got a bunch of options. Now that we've identified it as a maximum, we can go down to option number four under second trace, that's your calculate menu. Option number four, it asks for a left bound. Hopefully y'all know how to do this, but refresher if you don't, move your cursor to the left side of that maximum. Right bound, move it over to the right side, press enter. You don't have to move it for the guess. You can if it really bothers you, but you don't have to. Press enter, and it gives you two. Okay? Negative point five. The only thing is, it's going to give it to you in decimal form. And if they're asking you this question on the final exam, they're probably going to have the answer choices in uh, fractional form because they're wanting to know if you can calculate it by hand. But we all know negative point five. Um, but there's the vertex in case you forget how to calculate it by hand. Now, we are going to have a quiz on this in a couple of days, and I'm going to ask to see the work. Okay? So you do need to be able to show me um, how to calculate that by hand. Now, let me mention something else that you need to know without looking at the graph of this. You need to know how to determine whether it's a maximum or a minimum without seeing the picture. Does anybody know how we can tell whether a parabola is going to have a maximum or minimum before we even look at the graph? Yep. If A is negative, if A is negative like it is here, open downward and it's going to have a maximum. So this is probably something you want to write down somewhere. Um, maximum when A is negative. and a minimum when A is positive. Now that's one of those things to me, it's kind of backwards. Typically we associate positive with maximums and negative with minimums. So that one's kind of backwards. Um, but just think about, if it's negative, it's gonna open downward, so it's gonna have that maximum value as opposed to a minimum value when it opens up, which is what typically happens x squared, y'all know that makes u, so that's a minimum. Okay, now, increasing and decreasing. This may be new, or you may have seen it and might not remember everything about it. Um, we've got to decide when our function is increasing and when it is decreasing. So let's look at our graph here. Okay, let's move left to right. Okay, so when we're moving left to right, we start on the left side of our graph over here, and we're moving towards the vertex, what are the y values doing? We come to the left side and move towards the vertex, what are the y values doing? They're increasing. Okay, so increasing and decreasing is asking what are the y values doing, but the way we answer it is where, okay? Where is this happening? And we use the x values to describe this. Okay, where is this happening? Where are our y values increasing? So, I encourage you, on your graph right there, I want you to put negative infinity over here on the left side of your x-axis. I want you to put positive infinity on the right side of your x-axis. I don't want you to do that on the y-axis yet. Okay? Only do it on the x-axis. So we're moving from the left side to our vertex. So we're moving from negative infinity until what's our x value here at the vertex? This is x equals negative one half, right? Our axis of symmetry, our vertex. So we are increasing from negative infinity until we get to negative one half. 